New research suggests that there may be another side effect associated with the COVID-19 vaccine. Postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, also known as POTS, is a condition where people may suddenly get a fast heart rate or a drop in their blood pressure, especially if they stand up too quick. But for many people, they feel lousy most of the time. Now, this can also happen after COVID virus itself. So let's talk about it. Hey, everybody, it's Dr. David. Please, of course, if you're not subscribed to this channel, please do so. Join us at our other social media platforms and become a, a supporter of ours on Patreon. So postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Um, this is a dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is something that we actually don't have control over, and it controls a lot of bodily functions like breathing rates and heart rates and blood pressure. There's a, there are neurotransmitters such as epinephrine, norepinephrine, and acetylcholine, which direct these different bodily functions. And there's actually two different parts of this system. There's the sympathetic nervous system. This is the fight or flight that you hear about when people have to react quickly if there's a stressful situation. There's also called the parasympathetic nervous system. And this is more what calms the body, relaxing, especially after the stress or danger has maybe settled down. Now, the common side effects associated with POTS are lightheadedness, fainting, palpitations, headaches, feeling nervous, feeling anxious, or shaking and sweating. And also, again, just can feel lousy. Now, the timing of this, some people will get it in flares. They may have a couple good days or good weeks and go back and forth. But there are other people who are feeling this way almost all the time. Now, the demographics of this, there's, it's estimated that one to three million people in the United States suffer from POTS. Now, ordinarily, it is found in most commonly in women under the age of 50. But men can also get it. Um, and I also have seen teens develop this. It's actually one of the things that I've been working a lot on on my clinic. And I see a lot of families bringing their, um, their teen daughters, especially to me, just uh, diagnosed another one of them today. Um, but a new study that came out just back in December of 2022 um, that um, was looking at patients at the Cedars Sinai, which is a major hospital and, and hospital system in Los Angeles. And there were 285,000 people who were part of the study. And that, and, and these are the number of people who were vaccinated. Okay. 93% of them did get a messenger RNA vaccine, which of course, that's probably the numbers that we have nationwide overall. Now, what they were doing is they looked to see what the odds were of somebody getting this developing POTS in the 90 days prior to getting a vaccine and then compared it to 90 days after getting the vaccine. So the pre versus post type of comparison. Um, they also were looking at other POTS related conditions, things such as mast cell dysregulation, um, dysautonomia, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Um, and again, they were looking for 90 days before and after those as well. And there's a lot of crossover between POTS and those other diagnoses. Now, there were a total of 4,500 POTS-related diagnoses that were made um, amongst the, among the, the people who were, who were looked at. 2,580 of them may, um, were received the diagnosis and, and was positive after getting the vaccine. So with this, with, if you look at those numbers, that meant that the odds of a POTS-related diagnosis after getting vaccinated was 33% greater than, from taking if the, than before the vaccine. Now, the, the authors did note that there were only 25 new cases of myocarditis, um, which is, um, of course, what we know is kind of like the best characterized significant side effect associated with the vaccine. Um, but seven were from before the vaccine and 18 after. So, again, there were more after. But there was actually that's, a, you know, some of the numbers might have predicted even a little bit more of that. But that's what the numbers are. Now, in addition, they looked at 1,200. Uh, 12,460 people um, who had the SARS infection, the COVID vac uh, infection, not the vaccine. And again, they looked at the people during this time period, the 90 days before they got the infection, and then the 90 days after the infection. 
Um, and of these, there were f- about a thousand people um, who developed POTS. Six hundred and five of them happened after getting the disease, the wild disease. And so when they actually crunched these numbers, they found that a person was five times more likely to develop POTS after having the infection compared to after the vaccine. So, of course, this is an association. This is not something that's in proof that we should absolutely be making our decisions on. But to point out that as with many other things that we've seen from side effects relative to the vaccine, that the same symptoms can be seen in a person who has the wild disease and after. Okay. Now, blood clots being another one besides the myocarditis, the pericarditis, again, things that we've seen after both of these things. Now, I... My theory about all of this is that the problem is possibly the spike protein itself. However, you get it. Now, of course, when a person gets a messenger RNA vaccine, the messenger RNA, which is related to genetic code, is converted to the spike protein. And then the spike protein is what the immune system reacts against. Okay. Whereas when a person has a natural disease, The virus itself is replicating, replicating in many, many cells. And each time that that replicates, of course, there's more spike protein that's produced. So both of these situations will have an increase in spike protein. That's the reason when we do a vaccine titer for the spike protein, it shows positive whether a person's had the vaccine or whether a person's had the wild disease. Now, the vaccine itself, the messenger RNA, so it has a half-life of up to 16 hours. A half-life is the amount of time it takes for whatever it is that you're measuring in the blood to be reduced by half, okay? And it's typically felt that within four to five half-lives that the that the um, substance is out of the body, which means in this situation that the M- messenger RNA itself would clear the body in three to four days. Once that's been cleared, there's no more spike protein being made if there's no more messenger RNA to be read to be turned into the spike protein. Okay. Now, when a person gets the wild disease, obviously this virus is replicating and replicating the body. It has been cultured out live in over 20 days after a person's had an infection. There's even some very rare cases of much, much longer than that. But for almost everybody, the virus is replicating in their body for more than the four days that messenger RNA would be made from the vaccine. Okay, so I do wonder, since the spike protein is around longer with natural infection, might that be the reason why these same symptoms, these same side effects are more commonly being seen in people who have the wild disease? Seems that these effects are happening to both sets of people. Okay, now, whether a person is choosing to vaccinate or whether a person is going to get natural infection, we kind of look at it the same way. The same supplements that we recommend giving if as soon as a person gets sick are the same supplements we recommend giving before and after taking a vaccine. Um, now, of course, other things are really important in terms of optimizing the immune system, because in the end, what this is all about is our body's immune response to the spike protein. Okay, so of course, there are antibodies that are made, there are um, white blood cells that are produced from memory. And of course, that as part of that process, there's inflammation. So anything that we can do to try to keep inflammation at a minimum, or to have an immune system that allows for the um, immune for, for the inflammation to not get out of control, that would be ideal. So that's why we talk again, and here we go for a plug. I think it's been at least a week since I've given a plug for vitamin D and zinc, but that's such an important role. The the moderation, modulation of the immune system without causing suppression, super important. Why we use certain supplements around this, um, such as high-dose vitamin A for a couple days. Why I use Enhanza, which is a form of activated curcumin, wonderful anti-inflammatory. High doses of omega-3 fatty acids, Again, anti-inflammatory. But not just that, lifestyle. We know so much now about the importance of lifestyle in terms of controlling inflammation. Being outside in the sun, not just getting vitamin D from a supplement, but there's an additional benefit with um, with infrared light that can happen from sunlight that you can't get from a supplement, although the supplement is important to get your levels up. 
but also having just being, you know, having being in good exercise, being in shape overall, right? People who have have high inflammatory diets as opposed to a more anti-inflammatory diet. Of course, getting good sleep, getting good exercise, all of those things that we know are so, so important in terms of having a healthy life and trying to fight things off as best that we can. All right, so there you go. You know, this is a condition that seems to be associated both from the vaccine, but also in a greater um, in a greater number following the natural disease. Have a nice day. See that subscribe button there? Please turn it from red to gray. 